All right, good morning. Welcome to Timberline Windsor. Would you stand with us this morning as we worship? We are continuing our series, our playlist series, and this morning we're talking about worship as warfare, and, and so just invite you to jo join and sing worship with us today as we, as we worship. beginning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Timberline Windsor. We're so glad you're here this morning. Um, whether you're here in the living room with us or joining us online, oh, what an honor to have you here this morning to take a deep breath. What a blessing and a delight to just spend some time together. My name is Linda Motter, and I'm your host this morning, which basically means I get to come and say welcome and good morning. And uh, I have to share a funny thought that I had yesterday. Um, I've often told my friends that when I retire, I think the best gig in the world for me is to be a Walmart greeter. Because I thought, what better way than to just like see people and say, hi, welcome to Walmart. 
And then I started laughing, and I thought, oh, God is so funny, because here he has me doing this fun little gig, going, hi, welcome to Timberline Windsor. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he answers prayers sometimes in funny little ways. But regardless of uh, why you're here, if this is your first time, by the way, welcome. We'd love to have you fill out a connection card. There's one in front of you. You can also scan the QR code and do that digitally. But there is a beautiful, specially crafted service for each of us here this morning. But did you know it's not the only thing that's created every week for all of us? We desire for you to be connected beyond Sunday mornings. And so we call these connection groups. And they're things for all people of ages and stages and interests. And if you have not found a way to connect, can I just implore you to do that this week? Um, I'm, a, I'm a junkie. I'm in four or five different groups. And as much as I love me my Sunday mornings, let me tell you my growth and my depth of connection to God and to others really has come so much through my connection groups. So feel free to ask me about those or anybody else or, hey, maybe each other. Maybe you can share what you're connected to. And if you're not, encourage each other to find a place this week to connect. But alas, we're here and, and it's a Sunday morning. And like I said, um, there's a powerful service waiting for you here, and it's not an accident that you're here. God has something specific for each and every one of us sitting here today. So I ask you to open your heart and your mind and get focused and look for the little nugget that God's prepared for you. So let's go find those nuggets as we continue to worship.
right, let's give him praise today. Come on. All right, well, at this time, we're going to just call our ushers forward. We're going to take up our offering this morning. And as always, this is just a, a time for us as a church family to give back to God out of gratitude, gratefulness in our hearts. And, and if you're a guest with us, we don't ask you to participate. But let's just take a moment and pray over our offering this morning. God, thank you so much. God, you're a faithful God, and you are so faithful, God, to us. Um, and we're thankful, God, for all that you provide, all that you do, God. Um, Lord, we just worship you this morning. We just thank you so much for your provision, for your, your help, God. And even as we worship and, and talk about warfare this morning, God, thank you that you're with us. And we just pray a blessing over this offering that could be used for your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, we lift your name high. We pray that you would be with us in the middle of the battle. We sing your name because we know that we can trust you. And we sing it louder and louder and raise our hallelujah until our hearts believe and can trust, until we have that confidence that comes from the reminder that you are with us through the storm. Sing this out together. The reign of darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. Come on, sing it out. God, we worship you today. Jesus, you reign above it all, God. We're, we're so thankful. 
God, we just worship you. Thank you that you are a God. We know that you have won the battle, God. You have won the war, Jesus. And so we worship you, God, from that point of victory, God, that you have won, Jesus. Thank you that you reign above it all, that you are truly God. You are the Lord of the universe, Jesus. We're so thankful, God, that we can just align ourselves, God, with you today through worship, through praise, God. And we just worship you, God. So, so thankful, God, for all that you've done, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning as we continue with our playlist series, a series that reminds us all to bring our hearts and our voices together before the Lord. And this morning, I'm going to share with you about warfare. And you might be thinking, well, what the heck does warfare have to do with playlists and singing and bringing our hearts together? And voices to the Lord. Well, hopefully, by the time we leave here in the next few minutes, that I will have adequately shared with you the importance of you and I using our voices when it comes to waging war against an enemy that wants to do everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy your life and mine. This morning, we're going to take a look at, at two passages of Scripture. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 6 and 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So those of you who like to get a head start in finding a passage of Scripture, you can do that now. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons. Anybody else do that? Yeah, I grew up watching uh, Saturday morning cartoons, um, like many of you, and I enjoyed uh, Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, and I looked forward to following along with their winsome adventures, but probably my, my favorite cartoon character was this guy. <laughs> Who's that guy? Yosemite Sam, that's right. Now, I'm not sure if if Yosemite Sam was a cowboy or a gold miner, but one thing for sure is that he was a cantankerous, ornery old guy who had a hair trigger temper. Now, I also love watching these two guys chasing one another around the desert with the roadrunner constantly outsmarting Wile E. Coyote. But cartoon characters, as we all know, are not real, are they? And it can seem the same when we talk about the devil or Satan. Oftentimes, especially in our Western culture, we can reduce Satan to a cartoon character who simply lives in the world of make-believe. And over the years, he has been caricaturized as a guy who looks like this, like that guy, yeah. But if Satan, in all of his evil glory showed up looking like this, we would notice him, wouldn't we? I mean, he would stick out like a sore thumb. But what we know for sure is that he usually shows up in ways that are much more sinister and much more subtle in nature. And of course, anytime we talk about Satan or the devil, uh, that discussion can go one of two ways. Either people can see him behind every bad thing that happens in the world, or they simply dismiss him and put him in the realm of a cartoon character. The French poet Charles Baudelaire, he once famously said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he does not exist. It's so true, isn't it? So the first thing for us to understand when it comes to warfare is simply understanding, and this is the first point in your, uh, in your outline in the bulletin, is that, is that Satan is real. 
Satan is real. And if he is real, well, then how do we wage war against such an intimidating adversary? What kind of weapons do you and I as mere mortals use? You know, over the course of history, mankind has found no shortage in using weapons against one another. But in the space of the supernatural, the weapons of warfare are much different. And as we read God's word, we are reminded that God's presence and his word are weapons that you and I can use each and every day. The Apostle Paul, he talks about this supernatural battlefield as he writes to the church of Ephesus. He's reminding the Ephesians and us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is reminding all of us that our real battle, the battle that's being waged all around us, is spiritual in nature. One theology professor has noted, according to the Bible, life is not a picnic, but a battle, an armed struggle against a powerful adversary. And if that is true, and we see examples of this all throughout the scriptures, and most of us know this all too well in our own lives, don't we? That life is a battle. Well, if there is a spiritual battle going on around us, how do we wage war against these unseen forces? What kind of weapons can you and I use against things we can't see? Paul gives us the answer, and we continue to read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may, able, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? the word of God. In this passage, you notice that there are several different pieces of the soldier's uniform that Paul is describing. And the way that this passage is often taught is that Paul was writing this letter while in prison, and he's looking at a Roman soldier who was guarding him. If this is true, he would have observed the soldier with wearing a belt. He has a breastplate on to cover his vital organs. He's wearing good sturdy shoes. And of course, he has a helmet on his head. And to deflect swords or things that are being thrown at him, he has a shield. But this isn't just Paul looking at a Roman soldier. See, Paul being a well-versed Jew and a member of the Sanhedrin would have drawn heavily from the Old Testament. Remember, that was their scripture at the time, the Torah and the books of the prophets and whatnot. So what he does is he pulls heavily from that, particularly from the prophet Isaiah. An example, Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Does that sound familiar? Sure. For shoes, again, Paul would have referenced Isaiah. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Remember what Paul wrote to the Ephesians? And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the gospel, the good news. 
and the belt of truth. Paul, again, he's referencing Isaiah. Righteousness shall be your belt of, of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And the same is true with uh, the remaining pieces of armor. I point to all of this out because the armor of God is exactly that. It is the armor of God. As author Lane Duguid says, yet the armor is first and foremost God's armor rather than ours. Through the gospel, the, the divine warrior gives us his equipment, which he wore first triumphantly in our place in his definitive struggle against the forces of evil. You know, it's interesting to note that all of the pieces of armor that Paul describes are defensive in nature, all except for one. What is it? Yeah, the sword. The sword. Paul equates a soldier's sword to the word of God that is to be used as an offensive weapon. And that's the second point for you to jot down. The word of God is an offensive weapon. And we see an example of how the word of God is used by Jesus as an offensive weapon when he was confronted by Satan in the desert. Remember the story? Three times Satan comes to Jesus and tries to tempt him. And each time Jesus uses the word of God as an offensive weapon in dealing with Satan. I mean, heck, even Satan himself recognizes the word of God as an offensive weapon. And just as the word of God is an offensive weapon, so is our worship of God. I like what Dr. Charles Kraft has to say about worship. He says, worship is one of the most important things human beings can do, not because it feeds God's ego, but because it lines us up with him and against our enemy. Worship is an act of war. It's also an act of participation, strengthening our relationship with God and with each other. In worship, we declare we are on God's side. We declare this to God, to ourselves, to other people, and to the whole spirit realm. I love that. When you and I lift our hearts and our voices in unison to God, powerful things happen, both here on a Sunday morning as well as in the heavenly realms. And my guess is that you've probably never thought of singing as an act of war, have you? But throughout history, mankind, as he's prepared for battle, has sung before going off to war, from Vikings to Mongols to African Zulus, all would sing war chants before going into battle. And perhaps you've seen a modern day version of, of, of this, and it looks something like this. Does that get you pumped up or what? Are you ready to go into battle? <laughs> that is the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team. And what they do before every rugby match is that. That's the haka. It's pretty intimidating, isn't it? That's the whole point. Songs, chants, and hakas have been used by armies to not only intimidate but to also unify and raise the courage and morale of those heading off into battle. And into battle, they would charge with their weapons raised high. But I want to read to you a passage of scripture where singing led to an improbable victory. In the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, we learn about a king named Jehoshaphat who was faced with an impossible battle. We see him, he's seeking the Lord in prayer, and he's confessing his powerlessness to destroy the enemy. The enemies are the Moabites and the Ammonites, 
two people groups who up until that point historically had been a thorn in the side of the Hebrews. And these two groups of people, they're on the attack. And apparently, there's a lot of them. In fact, there's so many that Jehoshaphat, he's thinking, boys, I think this is it. We're done for. And he cries out to God, and he says this. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance, the promised land. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And here is my favorite line in the entire passage. He says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Like King Jehoshaphat in this dire situation, I know that some of you, perhaps many of you, right now are facing battles where you're saying, God, I have no idea what to do. And you're feeling the fiery arrows of the evil one. You know, just this past week, my wife and I, we were in that situation. We were facing something that in a million years we would never have thought would have happened. And we had no idea what to do about it. And because of that, we were feeling pretty powerless. Are any of you feeling that today? Where the battle that you're facing can only be won if the Lord himself intervenes. Whatever your battle is, I want you to know this, and this is a promise, that God sees you. Your battle has not taken him by surprise. He knows exactly what you're facing. So we're gonna do something a little different now in our service. We're gonna provide a little bit of space. Just take a minute to pray for those of you who are currently in it, and you have no idea what to do and you need God to show up. If that is you, I want to invite you to stand. Stand right where you're at. And the rest of us are going to pray over you. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And you folks who are tuning in online, we know that oftentimes it can feel like you're separated from our worship experience this morning. But I want to invite you to be a part of this as well and stand right where you're at. So if you need prayer, just go ahead and stand, and we'll go ahead and pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for our gathering this morning. We thank you, God, that you're a God who sees us right where we're at, that you're a God who knows exactly what we're going through. And I pray for those folks who are currently in a battle. God, you know what their need is. Father, that you would encourage them with the right words, with the right people to come alongside them and remind them that you love them, that you love them beyond measure. So be with them, grant them your comfort and peace. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Remember, Jehoshaphat said, Lord, I don't know what to do. Here's the good news. The Lord responded to him by saying, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but whose? God's. Tomorrow, I want you to march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass." Of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. 
take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. You know, that's the second time God says that in that passage. Do you think that's important? Yeah. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow. And the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice early in the morning. They left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. What general or king put singers out on the front lines? Nobody. Nobody does that. God does. He put the singers out on the front lines ahead of the rest of the army. And they went out saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise the Lord, set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. It's interesting to note that before they went into battle, they were singing songs of praise. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Theologian Eugene Merrill, he says, the singers inspired the people with their words of encouragement to trust the Lord. There's a few things we can learn from this passage of scripture. The third point in your outline, we have to face our battles. Now that may sound like a no-brainer to all of you, but many times... People, when they're faced with a challenge, will either ignore it or hope that it'll just go away. It won't. My wife and I, this past week, we had to face the battle we were dealing with head on. And we knew it was not going to be any fun. But we were reminded of what God's word told us. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out, face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. And the Lord was with my wife and I. Remember, the king's army still had to go out. They still had to take their positions, and it's the same with you and I. We can't just sit back and say, uh, okay, God, go to work. We can't do that. We have to do our part. We have to show up and face our battles head on. And as we read, God's word tells us that he was with the army and he's with us as well. But it still requires action on our part. So we have to face our battles. The fourth point, our voices matter. You know, the first question in, of the Westminster Shorter Catechism Ask, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The way you and I glorify God is by the way that we live our lives, but also by giving praise to God with our voices. Pastor John Piper, he says, even though the victory belongs to God, the human means through which God gives victory is the ministry of of the choir. We see in the passage that we just read, it was a chorus of voices that led the army to victory. Now, I want to be clear that I am not saying if you're someone facing a, 
a cancer diagnosis or a broken marriage or a wayward child, that your songs of praise are going to automatically fix those things because there's a good chance that it won't. You know, last week I was visiting with a friend of mine and I told this friend that I was coming out here to visit with you folks and uh, this person asked what I was going to be speaking on so I shared... uh, kind of a synopsis of my message. And this person is someone who's, who had a child who died from a drug overdose not too long ago. And as I shared my message with this person, I asked, I said, how are you hearing what I'm saying? How does what I'm saying feel to you? And then I asked this person, I said, uh, How do you thank God in the midst of battle? And this individual responded by saying, I praise God regardless of the outcome. Wow. Is that crazy? I praise God regardless of the outcome. You know, I don't know about you, but praising God in the midst of challenge is so hard for me to do. How often do you and I pray to God, but we don't get the outcomes that we desire? Am I the only one? This is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to our faith. Because if we, you and I don't get what we hope and pray for, is God still worthy to be praised? If, if God doesn't come through with what we hope and pray for, does that mean that he's any less faithful? Does it mean that he is any less good, that he no longer loves us? No. I think we all know the answer to that. God's ways are higher than our ways. And because of that, you and I can praise him in our time of need. Let's go ahead and stand together. And Kirsten's going to lead us in one final song. I don't know where you're at this morning with your battles. But you might just want to let this song wash over you as these truths tell you the faithfulness of God. And maybe you've gotten through your battles and you can sing this song with confidence with me. But let's just all praise God together through this song, through these lyrics. You go.
wanting for us to go. Lord, we thank you that you are the same always, that you know what came before our battle. You know what's going on right now in our battle. And you know what's going to happen when we get through this battle. Lord, we praise you. We lift up our arms. We surrender our will to yours. And we just ask that you take us through. You carry us. You make your way known so that we can follow you. We want to trust in your faithfulness. And we will sing until our hearts feel that. Because we know it in our minds. We want to have our hearts feel that confidence. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room, anyone online right now who's going through that battle. I pray that you would strengthen them, lead them through it. And for those of us who can declare the ways that you've gotten us through, we praise you. And we tell those around us what you have done for us. So Lord, as we close our service, we want to praise you one more time. Because you are the God from whom all blessings flow. You are our Father. You are the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we praise you now. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. wonderful week. See you back here next week.